MongoDB is a very popular document database, and if you're writing applications in C Sharp and you want to leverage MongoDB, odds are you need to be able to query for documents at some point. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the basics of using C Sharp to work with MongoDB in order to query different documents that you have in your MongoDB database. We'll look at some of the basic filters and the methods that we have access to. A quick reminder to check that pinned comment for information about my free weekly newsletter and my courses on Dome Train. Okay, so this is going to be using the MongoDB C Sharp driver. If you're not familiar with how to set all of the things up that you see on the screen from this part right up to the beginning here, including your connection string and all of that, you can check out this video that I posted before and then come right back and continue watching this. But that'll walk you through how you can start inserting documents and connect to your MongoDB database. What we're going to be looking at is filtering. And in particular, we're going to use filters to be able to ask MongoDB for records that match those filters. So to start off, what we're going to use is this filter property that we have off of this builder's static class. In my particular case, I have a collection and I'm not going to be using DTOs that are mapped to specific records. So I don't have a dedicated record type that I've created. We're just going to be using the B BSON document to be very generic and open-ended, but we asked the builder static class for BSON documents, this generic type here, for this filter property. And that filter property gives us this filter builder that we have here. And the filter builder is going to have the different methods on it that we can use to construct filters and combine them together. So we're going to start with some really basic options here. What I'm doing here is starting with line 18, we have filter builder dot empty. So I'm assigning this completely empty filter to a variable. And what we can do from there is start to combine this empty filter with other things that we're looking for. And this is a completely unnecessary step if you're doing something as basic as this filter right here. So if we just wanted to match the name property of our record to look for one that says Nick Cosentino, so we're looking for me, if we just wanted to do that, we could have literally replaced that entire part on line 18 with just code from right here. So that's all you would need. But if you're starting to build more complex filters up and you need to optionally include or exclude different things, I like being able to have a filter variable that I can start tacking things onto. So that's why this is structured this way. And we'll see a little bit more of that later. Now I wanna go run this and show you how it works but we need to see how we call MongoDB, that driver class that we have, in order to perform the query. And I need to show you that, and I need to show you the records in the database so that we can see what we should be expecting back. So I scroll down a little bit lower, we'll see that from line 42 till 55, so this block of code here, I just have a couple of different ways that we can go ask for that data. Collection.find, passing in the filter, is what we need to do to be able to start getting results. But once we pull those results back, how we enumerate them or how we look at them can be done in a handful of different ways. So what I'm doing on line 46 is I'm just saying, hey, results, I just want to put you into a list. And you'll notice that a variation of that on line 50, I'm doing a for each loop over it. But results itself is not an I enumerable. So we have to ask it to be made as an I enumerable with this method to enumerable. But both of these ways are options that you could use, right? So calling to list on something and materializing or making a copy of a collection could be very expensive for memory. If we were able to just stream things in, that might be more performant. What I have not done at this point in time, which will be a follow-up video, is doing performance characteristics both for runtime and memory footprint about these two different options. So for example, if we've called find, has it materialized the full result set in memory already? If that's the case, is there a streaming API that we could use instead? All of that's still to come. This is just the very basics of being able to filter and pull things back. So I will show you both these variations. The results will be identical when we see them in the console, which is good news. And before I run this, let's go look at Compass. So Compass is going to be the tool that you can get directly from MongoDB. It's just a, an explorer. You can run queries and stuff on it. You can even edit the documents that you see on the screen uh, and change them to be whatever you'd like or add or delete them, right? So um, I just press this to show the JSON form of it. But if we're looking for records or documents that have name as Nick Cosentino, if we have three documents in this collection, you can see two of them do have my name. The one at the bottom here that says dev leader, 
that name is obviously not going to match Nick Cosentino. So if we go back to the code, we should expect that if we're asking for Nick Cosentino, we get two results in both of these cases, right? It's the same query. We're just doing a for each loop in one case and two list on the other. So let's go run this and see what happens. Okay, so it's a little bit messy because we printed out the records in the second case, but you can see it starts with finding records, converting those results to a list, and then it says we got two results in that list. I didn't do a for each loop on that list, we're just getting the count printed out. But in the second example for enumerating the results, you can see that it got two records coming back, right? And both of them have name as Nick Cosentino and name as Nick Cosentino in the second one. So it did pull back two of them and they both have unique IDs. This one ends in D9 and this one ends in DA. So two records came back out of the three. So that should prove that we filtered on the two that match. Now, briefly, I wanted to show you this other syntax that we can use right here on line 23. I personally think that this is a lot more readable than using sort of this uh, a little bit more complex syntax or a little bit more verbose where we have to keep asking the filter builder to and. So basically asking the filter builder to create this other object that we can add to filters inside of to and them, right? We can kind of skip that entire thing just by doing this. So we're saying, I wanna take the filter and and it with, and then reassign, that's and equal, to just the filter that we wanna do. If we read what's on the screen now, would be starting with an empty filter filter and then anding it to this one and then reassigning that back into filter. It's exactly what this did, but in my opinion, as long as you're comfortable with this operator, so the and equal, I think it's a lot more readable. And when you start having more and more filters put together, I think the uh, amount of verbosity that you get with this is just a little bit overkill. Okay, next I want to talk about the or operator, right? So we just saw and equals, this is the or equals, and the pipe operator is or. And what I'm going to do is have another filter on name, and I'm going to look for text that shouldn't match anything. And I want to show you something kind of peculiar about doing this. You'll notice that I'm just reusing the variable filter and reassigning it to empty, just so I can keep this example going. But line 27 means we're starting with an empty filter. Then from there, I'm going to or it with the name filter that won't match anything. And we should see something interesting when I go run this. So let's do the same example here. And even though it wasn't supposed to match anything, it matched all three records. And in fact, if you look at the name for all of them, none of those names say doesn't match anything, right? That's what we asked for. It says name doesn't match anything. And it included everything. So why is that the case? Well, the empty filter itself is kind of like match all. So what we've effectively done is said, take a match all filter and or it with something that won't match anything. The result of that is that it will still match everything. So we have to be very careful if we're using this pattern that I was talking about with oring, because if we do that with an empty filter, that means that we're going to match anything all the time because anything you or with this will always match everything. But okay, we want to see the or filter in action, not just accidentally including everything because it was combined this way. And we've already seen the and equals. So let's do it maybe a little bit more complex of an example. Okay, so this this particular example uses an and equals and an or equals. So if I'm doing this here, if I'm and equaling name to not match anything, this combination that I have highlighted will say match everything and match it with nothing. And because it's an and, it means that nothing will end up matching now. If we have a filter that matches nothing and then we or it with this one, this says that we should match nothing or match subscribers equal to a thousand, which effectively means that we'll only be matching things where subscribers equals a thousand. So let's do this in a couple of steps. I want to prove to you first that by running this, we shouldn't get any results because there's nothing with the name no match here. That should be pretty obvious. And before moving on, I just wanted to take a quick note to show you my dome train courses that I have available now. I do have two that are focused on C sharp, which you can see right here and right here. So we have a getting started and a deep dive course. The getting started one is perfect for people that haven't even programmed before. I'll teach you all the basics you need to get up and running and working with C Sharp. And the deep dive builds directly on top of that so that you have more experience working with C Sharp and you feel a lot more capable working with the language to go develop applications. Together, both of these courses are just around 11 and a half hours of all of the basics of C Sharp that you'll need to get up and running. Of course, building on top of all of that, I had my refactoring course that's available. And this is going to teach you different methods that you can use to refactor code, clean up your code base, 
space and make sure that you're not trapped working with spaghetti legacy code. If you like the style of my YouTube videos and the way that I teach, I think these courses will be perfect for you. And there we go, zero results, but that's not that exciting because we knew that was gonna work. Now, if we do this and we're oring it here, what should happen? We got no results here, and this is subscribers equals 1,000, but do we have anything that matches 1,000 subscribers? Well, the answer is no, right? Because we only have things that have a million subscribers here. And that's on purpose. I want to walk through this example slowly because the only time we saw the OR operator working was matching on everything. That's not what we want. So I want to show you that when we add an OR operator in here, it will in fact do what we want and still not match anything because it's not finding anything with a thousand subscribers. Okay, now if we go to OR in a million subscribers, this should effectively match everything again. But we can get a little bit more creative because what we can do is go back to here and maybe modify one of these to not have a full million subscribers. So I'm gonna change this last one that says dev leader because it's different, right? I'm gonna make this one be one, two, three, and we'll do that many. So if we're trying to look for a million subscribers, this last one should be excluded. So just again, to revisit what we have, we're anding this filter that's matching no match here on the name to empty. And then we're oring in this one, which now should include all of the subscriber counts of 1 million. And there we go. We should be able to get just these two records back. This is showing the or filter properly including these things, right? It's not including everything. And it's not including everything because the subscriber count on the third record was one, two, three. And I wanted to make a quick note about this because the filter syntax that we have here with and equals and or equals can get very complicated very fast depending on what you're trying to do. You really need to think about the grouping of the things that you're combining together. So for example, once you start having ors included in here, you need to be thinking about if you're trying to group them up like think about where you would put the parentheses if you were writing this out as an if statement because if you wanted this or this and something else but this or this grouped together you need to go create a filter that's those two things ORed, and then take that filter and and the whole thing with another one so do Try to keep that in mind as you're building these out. If you're trying to just jam it all into one filter, so if you're not breaking it out into separate variables so that you can combine them more easily, I think you're going to be in for a, a lot of trouble trying to debug, you know, why certain things are matching. It's just this really easy opportunity to mess it up. And finally, I want to show you another variation of this find method where we're not changing what the filter is. So we're going to get the same set of results, but we're going to use a cursor instead. And what we're going to do with that cursor is change the batching size that we're pulling back. And I think going back to what I said earlier, I do need to benchmark these to show you the differences for memory, footprint, and performance. But based on what I'm seeing here, having the batch size being something we can configure probably means that if you're not batching, there's probably some upper limit to what we're pulling back into memory, or maybe it's unbound, which seems a little bit unsafe. But if you want to be able to control that, I think this is the thing that you're going to want to use. When we use a cursor, so you can see down here, we get this move next syntax. So it kind of feels like using a for each loop. But the difference is that we're going to be getting sets of data in batches, which is what this part controls, this outer loop. And then once we have a particular batch, then we use a for each loop on that. So you can think about it like if we had a million records and we were trying to pull them back in batches of a thousand, we would go through move next a whole bunch. And every time we did this for each loop, it would be on sort of like pages or batches of 1000 records. I suspect that this probably controls the memory footprint, but has some overhead in terms of round trip time, but still to be benchmarked. So I will follow up with that in a video. So what we're going to do is run this. I have a batch size of two and I'm going to put a breakpoint in here as well because I want to see if we have three records, if we end up hitting this move next part twice to get two pages, right? One will be a page of size two or a batch of size two and the next will be of size one. But that means that we should go adjust our filter as well. So I'm just going to take off the filter. So instead of seeing just those two results come back, we should see all three. And that means that we should see this hit twice. Okay, so this is the first breakpoint hit. So we're going into here. This is the first page. Hopefully we see two come through. That's the second iteration on that first page. And if we go back up, we should go in one more time, and we do. And this time, this for each loop should only go in once. That's for our third item and final item. 
So we'll go in, okay, write the third result out. And this should not go in now because we've seen all three, great. And when I go back up to the top, move next should be false. So we should hopefully leave the loop right now. And we do. So the find options with a batch size allows you to control that. And then with the cursor, we can step through page by page with a little bit more control. And those are some of the options that we have to play with when querying documents from MongoDB. We got to see a handful of different ways where we could take things to a list, to enumerable, or using a cursor. And we also got to see how we could combine filters using and equals and or equals, or that more verbose syntax where we ask the filter builder to and two other filters together. Just a quick reminder that you're going to want to pay a lot of attention when you're building up complex filters with ands and ors because once you start incorporating ors into there, you really want to think about where your parentheses in theory would go, right? So try to draw it out on paper, try to draw it out as an if statement first so you can see where you put the parentheses and think carefully about how you would combine those things. If you've enjoyed this and you want to learn more about using MongoDB and C Sharp, when the next video is ready, you can check it out here. Thanks and I'll see you next time.